Do you guys have any questions for me or about things you've observed in the physical world around you? Yes, the units uh, for work are joules, so is all energy. Another unit that hardly anybody uses anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's what we get to cover today. Energies today. So who had a good breakfast? Got some good energy? I did. So, But I finally remembered to have lunch So just before class, so I'm good to go. <laughs> Anything else? Did you guys observe uh, some good forces and impulses during the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, that whole concussion thing with the helmets. <laughs> they, uh, I don't follow the teams that much, but I'm at least aware that the concussion problem seems to get worse and worse. And what's the whole point of a, of a helmet? To not get concussions, and you you know why now. So tell me in terms of physics, why do you wear a helmet? That's right. If you lengthen the time of impact, you can decrease the amount of force, which will cause the what? That force and time cause a what? And it's an impulse. Good. Say it again. Yeah, the change in momentum. You're trying to stop someone change their momentum, that requires an impulse. Of, and so you can play with the force and the time, yeah. Helmets are, as, as you, you remember from Rich's class, the number one thing when you're doing any activity, sports, tumbling, cycling, wear a helmet. It's the s one simplest thing you can do to improve your chances. Because if you hit your head, think about your brain, right? It's sitting here floating in some fluid. And if your head stops, what's your brain keep doing? Right, inertia keeps it going until it slams into something. That's not good. <laughs> Plus, you don't want to break your skull. So just wearing a helmet is the best thing you can do. Um, and they're mostly effective. Problem is, with as much force as some people are ex exposing their bodies to, no helmet can save you <laughs> from everything. In the skiing industry, well, as opposed to not wearing them at all, which is just yeah. outright dumb. But like, so the, the way that like they work now, if they're really saving their lives, or if they're not, they're yeah, the, some sports you hit, you injure more body, different body parts at a different rate. But if you're going to hit your head, it's better to have them than not. yeah, skiing. I mean, you can run into a tree, you can fall. If you're going to hit your head, and it's, it's it's plausible. You're safe for having a helmet. It's just like wearing a seatbelt. You've probably heard lots of stories about not wearing a seatbelt because I don't want to be trapped. Yes, that can happen, but the uh, statistics are in your favor that most of the time it's going to save your life because it's going to keep you from running into the windshield. And so, I don't know, what game do you want to play? I wear a seatbelt. And it's, it's, it's against the law not to, so there you go. <laughs> But see, it's all around us. I, I, I hope you're starting to, at least, whether you enjoy this class or not, appreciate physics and can at least start to recognize it around you. Uh, granted, I do it all my life, and most of you probably won't ever have to solve a, you know, okay, I'm going to fire this cannon. Let's see, I need it at this angle, at this velocity, so that it lands over there. You probably won't have to do that, but that, that's okay. You can still appreciate it when you look at things. So let's learn more about energy, shall we? That's a common term, way more common than momentum. And impulse. Who heard of impulse before this class? In, in this context, anyway. Yeah, not very many. Impulsive, like, oh, I, I just did that off of impulse. Maybe that'll help re trigger you that there's usually something about time involved in the common definition of impulse it has something to do with time usually quickly well that should hopefully trigger you that oh yeah time with force that time is important all right 
Uh, this is this is a good story. It's in your book. Just briefly, though, um, a gal named Emily Du Châtelet. She was uh, Voltaire's lover. Well, one of them, but his uh, most famous and probably most well loved. And I like this story because people argued. Did anybody read this in the chapter yet? I did. Good for you. Yeah, because women back then, women scientists weren't treated with much respect, let alone listened to. She earned respect and, and was. And it didn't, I'm sure it didn't hurt that she was associated with Voltaire. But the uh, point was, there's a big argument about this oomph. Uh, and in normal terms, we usually talk about how much effort somebody pushes or the oomph it has or it hits us and whacks us with, this, with something. And we've already discussed force. Maybe it's, are we talking about force? Are we talking about momentum? Because that's like inertia in motion, the fact of how fast it's moving also. But then there's this thing called energy. And oomph is a little vague. <laughs> and they were wondering what this was as they started getting into energy. Sorry. And... Argue, argue, argue. Here's a classic theorist versus experimentalist. And she was like Galileo. She did her research, and she learned that somebody else did it, and she reproduced it, and basically did an experiment and showed, oh, well, look, it's more proportional to the square of the velocity, this oomph, than just the velocity. If it was directly proportional to velocity, it would have been related to momentum, because that's mv. But she learned, as I'll discuss today, it was proportional to velocity squared. What's that mean? That means if you double the speed, what happens to the momentum? If you double the speed, what happens to momentum? It doubles because momentum is just mv. If you double v, then the momentum's double. If you triple the speed, you triple the momentum. How about energy? If you're going twice as fast, what will happen to the energy? It quadruples because of this squared velocity term. Energy is proportional to V squared. And that, that's what uh, she discovered. And then they could go places with that. And we have this chapter, and this is why we teach it to you. <laughs> uh, so if you triple the speed... Uh, I, you know, I'm just going to go three times faster. That's not that much. But you've actually increased your energy content by nine times. So in a sense, it'll be nine times harder to stop you. It'll take, to be more specific, it has nine times the oomph. No, we don't say that anymore. We say it's going to take nine times the amount of energy, nine times the amount of work to stop if you're going three times faster. Let me, let me show that. You're the first ones to see this. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> Sorry if I'm messing you up. All right, I have uh, some Hot Wheels cars. Because who doesn't love Hot Wheels? That's just a lead brick. And I'm going to back them up. And I'm going to get them moving. And so they're going to have some energy, the energy associated with motion. And today we learned that, well, I mentioned it last time, but it's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion. So it's based on how fast they're going. And it's proportional to the speed squared. So if you're cruising along and you run into a wall and you stop, you know what will happen to all the cars. They'll keep going. Friction will act on them. Let's just do it. If I give them a little kick here. Oh, that worked great. <laughs> So they all stopped at the same time. They all received the same impulse, if you will. However, something we're skipping is things on the outside go faster. How many have been on a merry-go-round? Do, do you get sick, more sick on the outside or the inside? The outside. Because things that are out there have to travel a bigger distance in the same amount of time. So if you're close to the center, like here versus out here, they both go around in the same amount of time, 
But this one has to cover a longer distance, correct? So his velocity is faster. Things on the outside that are rotating are going faster. So this car was going faster. And this one, and this one, and this one. And it was proportional. How much? But do you see the distances? This one stopped really quickly. He was going the slowest. But this one that was going roughly twice as fast as the first one took, went further. And it was more than double, a little bit more. And this one you know, roughly had to go one, two, three, four times as much, the distance, and so on. If you look at this from above, this is not a straight line. It curves like a squared graph would. She did a similar experiment by dropping balls into clay and saw how far they, it, the distance it took to smush into the clay to stop it. And that's how she arrived at this proportionality. So this oomph is energy, and it's re, it uh, goes to velocity squared. Don't forget that. So some definitions. They start with work. That's something you need to know about. I used to, as a kid, even when I was a physics student, think of work as a form of energy. Don't. I used to just think, oh, it's just one of the forms. It changes. Think of work as a, the, a way to change energy, to transform it. In other words, uh, like an object, you can say this has inertia. We can say it has momentum if it's moving. But we can't say it has work. It has the ability to do work on something. And that work then would change its energy. We can say it has energy. And that comes in different forms. And so it has the potential right now to do work on something and change that energy of itself or on something else. So don't think of objects as having work. They don't. They, just, they can have the ability to do work or transform the energy, make something speed up or slow down, move its location one way or another. The most confusing thing in physics I have to find with physics is uh, with work, you have to move something. You have to be able to do, do work on something in order for it to say you're doing work. Example is pushing on the wall. Am I exerting a force on the wall? Yes. And we know it's exerting back. But we would say I'm not doing work on the wall. Because I'm, I'm exerting a force on it, but it's having no effect on it. It's not moving it or changing it, speeding it up or slowing it down. I'm not chain, do, changing any of its energy. Well, I guess before I leave, what am I doing work on? Well, it's not moving either. Very good. My muscles. Because a lot of people think, well, you're, ex you're exerting effort. True, I'm, ex I'm expending energy the harder I push. So internally, I must be moving my muscles. They contract and I'm moving on the microscopic or biological scale. So those forces are causing things to happen. But no work has been done on the wall. No work was done on the floor because I didn't move them. So... People define this as works proportional to force. The harder you push, you think you could do more work. And you have to be able to move it a distance. So they put those together. And this is the form, our equation to guide our thinking for work. It's force times distance. You push on something, and the direction that force makes it move, the force in that direction, they line up. Then you've done work on it. A good example is, if I push on this door, I can move it that way. But if I push on it this way, straight into the hinge, it doesn't move. That's kind of dumb. I'm just wasting my, my force, and it's not causing any work to happen on it. Or, you guys know it's easiest to open a door by pushing on it perpendicular to it, because you want it to move that way. If you push on it this way, it's a lot harder because there's less force from me pushing it that way 
that's that component thing where you can break my force into two forces. You could break this this force into a, part of it's pushing that way and part of it's pushing that way. And only the part that's pushed in the direction it moves, they, they line, they got to line up, contributes to the work done. That's all I'm trying to emphasize here. Yes, Vicki? Victoria, sorry. Yep, so if there's no displacement, no change in position, no work done on that object. So like the wall, there was work done internally on me, but I wasn't concerned with that system. No work on, done on the wall. So that, that can confuse some folks. Another example, you know, uh, weightlifters. You know, they, they did work getting it up here. But physics would say, once you, just to hold it up there, maintain it, no work is done. Because we're not changing the barbell's energy. It's not changing position. It's not going faster or slower. We're just maintaining it. Kind of mechanical equilibrium. Force is still involved, but no work is done on the barbell. Yeah, Ron. So, like when you were pushing on the wall, you were trying to do work on the wall, but you didn't. But would that be an impulse? Because when I read that, I said force times distance. That's kind of like an impulse force times time. Good observation. Yeah, when I push on the wall, I try to do work, but I do no work on the wall. So there is no, no, there's no energy change for the wall. But yes, I am imparting an impulse to the wall because I apply a force for a certain amount of time. Yeah, some people get confused. The 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 author likes to say how long. Force for how long? And in English, how long can mean how much time the force is applied or if, how long does it, how, the distance it's trying to move it. And yeah, they seem similar, but they're different. This tries to change the momentum, which is proportional to mv. Well, it is mv. <laughs> and this tries to change the energy, which is proportional to velocity squared if you get it moving. Um, let's see, so that's work. Power is another term. That's another one, you know, in, uh, outside of physics, you can get force, momentum, impulse, energy, oomph, effort, power. They all kind of seem like the same thing. You guys in this class get to differentiate. What is power? In the most generic... I like that one. It's energy per time. It's the rate at which you use energy. It's another way, if that helps you. Rate of using energy. Which is why the time's on the bottom. And I mentioned this one several weeks ago. I'll come back to that. Once I tell you another form of energy. Now, the units for energy are joules, and that's another common one. Force is in newtons, distance is in meters, so a newton meter is a unit for energy. Work. Work transforms energy, so they have the same units. This is so common, though, it's the same thing as a joule. It's spelled like this. It's a guy's last name, like Newton. Power, then, gets its own, too. If energy is in joules, time is in seconds, a joule per second is its unit, joule per second. But that's so common, too. They gave that one what? Another guy's last name. A what? A what? What? Sorry, I love that joke. 
And where have you guys heard watts before? Several places, but hopefully a light bulb. Let's plug this one in. This is a 25 watt bulb. Here, we'll dim a little. So what's that mean? Well, now you know. That's the rate at which it's using up energy. That's the, the power rating for it, the rate we use energy. So one way to think of it is we're burning 25 joules of energy every second. 25 watts is 25 joules of units of energy every second. So it's transforming 25 joules of electrical energy into 25 joules of heat and light. Because energy is conserved. Total energy is always conserved. So if it starts out as electrical, it turns, it goes into heat and light in this case. So let's unplug that before it gets too hot and I can't touch it. <laughs> this is 100 watts. How is it different? And see, I wouldn't just say it uses more energy. It uses more energy, yeah, for the same amount of time. So yeah, that's exactly one way to think of it. It uses 100 joules of energy every second. But there's another way to think of it. This was 25 watts. This is 100 watts. You could think of it. How fast does it burn through 25 joules? This is 25 watt. This is 100 watt. So it's, it uses, there's a factor of 4 in there. It, if it uses 100 joules of energy every second, what's the time for burning 25 joules? A quarter of a second. Yeah, fourth the amount of time. So you can think of 100 watts as, yeah, uh, four times as much energy every second, the same amount of time, or it burns the same amount of energy, 25 joules, but in a fourth the time, a quarter of a second. So it's the rate you, you transform and use up energy. Uh, now I'm just going to see spots the rest of the lecture. <laughs> So that's work and power. Yeah, really, a bunch of spots. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's the two main types of energies. Potential. And kinetic. I sum them up that way. Potential energy, and before I carry on, the, all the, energy is energy, but it takes different forms, so we call them different things. But they're, all, excuse me, all in joules. They just manifest themselves differently. And so potential energy is energy associated with position. Uh, and one, the easiest example is gravitational potential energy. As you might think, if we're going to do work on something to lift this block up, what are we doing work on? The block. Yeah. Didn't mean for it to be a trick question. And what force are we trying to overcome? We have to exert a force against some other force. Gravity. So that's why we call it gravitational potential energy. There's no magic here. I don't want it to seem like a fancy term. So yeah. If I want to change that guy's position in this gravitational field, I've got to exert a force on it, up, and I lift it, look, a certain distance, right? So I just did work, force times distance. How much force am I applying to lift this? What's the minimum amount of force I need to lift this block? I heard some mumbling, but couldn't make any of it out. Yeah, it's weight. Right. If its weight is down, I have to at least do that much up. I have to do more than that initially to accelerate it and get it up to speed. But now we're move we can move at a constant speed, and the two forces are balanced. Mechanical equilibrium, as long as this thing's moving at a constant speed, right? So, yeah. If th so that's the force I need to lift it. And I just moved it a meter. So its weight, mg, 
times the distance I moved it. That was the work I did on the block, and that's how much I changed its energy. So that formula is pretty easy. All right, gravitational potential energy is something's weight times the distance you raise it, mgh. We'll call it h for height because it's vertical. You can sum that up like this if you want. So gravitational potential energy is just mgh. And again, the more inertia it has, the more energy it will take. If you double the weight of the block, it's going to take twice as much energy, to, twice as much work to lift at the same height. Gravity, that makes sense, and height, that's how far we're moving it. If you move it twice as far, you'll give it twice as much energy, or it takes twice as much energy to get it there. So if I lift this block from here up to here, I could ask you, how much energy does it have relative to the table? Because if you look at the table as height zero, what's its gravitational potential energy now? Yeah, zero. It's up here. Well, whatever that height is times its weight. That's how much gravitational potential energy it has. And so, see, it's the, the energy associated with its position. It has the potential to do work. So if I knock it off, or it can slide too. <laughs> yeah, it could run into something and knock something over and exchange energy. But look at this. Which takes more work? That or that? We got one vote for the same. We got one vote for a vertical. Other votes? Let me rephrase the question. See, good. You're thinking. That's what I want you to do. I'm trying to get you to think. How much gravitational potential energy does it have now? For com for com you know, then the two methods. How do they compare? The Good. I, yeah, I hope that one was more obvious. They're the same because it, it's, at, it's the same block. It has the same weight, mg, and it's at the same height. So, yeah, it has just changed its energy by this much, either path. And what did I have to do to the block to initiate that change? Yeah, I did work on it. And so the path length, it doesn't care. I can go like this. Ready? And I have just done the same amount of work to that as right. True, I might have expended more energy doing that, but the work done on the block is the same. Do you see? Because it, its energy has changed the same amount from beginning to end. Somewhere in the middle, it's something different. But from beginning to end, it's the same way. So just going like this requires the same amount of work done on the block as using a ramp and pushing it up. Which one do you think is easier to do? And by e easier, I have to put that in quotes. Uh, say this is a grand piano. And you got to get it into, into the truck up here, right? Do you want to go, Aah! or do you want to go like this? Yeah, why? Very good, Thomas. The force is less. That's what I meant by easier in this case. I can't lift the piano because MG is just too great. I, can't, I just physically can't exert that much force. But when you use a ramp, you guys already know that uh, the ramp's helping support the weight. So it doesn't require as much force from me. So now I can do it. But the caveat is energy is conserved. If this block's going to end up with the same amount of energy there as it does this way, 
then the same amount of work must be done on the block. This is MGH. This one is the force it takes for me to push times this distance, right? And you see that this distance is longer? <whistles> Ooh, sorry. If I'm going to use less force, I'm going to have to push at a bigger distance, this interplay, to get the same work. That's the whole idea by the second half of the chapter with the simple machines. If it... You're going to give the block the same work? Well, you can either do it with a big force over a little distance or a little force over a big distance. Simple machines can multiply force. They're great. They allow you to do things. They can multiply distance, too. Maybe for some reason you want more range of motion, so you want the greater distance. What can they not multiply and magically pull out of nowhere? Energy, good, Barbara, because energy is always conserved. Simple machines cannot magically give you more energy. They just allow you to make it easier because of this F. Can't do that. That I can do. I, and I, okay, I accept the fact I just have to do it for a farther amount of distance. That will allow me to, to uh, exert the same work on the block and have the same result. just might take longer. <laughs> So on that vein, if uh, what's your uh, book use? I think they say groceries. You know, you're carrying your groceries, and you can walk them up to your apartment to your to your house. Here you go. But you can also, without killing myself, you know, you can run. See, I'm getting better. <laughs> Which one took more work? Very good. Same work. See it. I'm, uh, gravitationally, I've changed the same. So it's, it took the same work, same energy. What was different? The power. But if you run when you do it, sure, you can use up that same energy in less time. So that'll take more power and you're, you'll breathe heavier. I mean, it does require more effort. <laughs> so it, it does match our, uh, what we're used to in the world anyway. All right, any questions on that at this point? So what's kinetic? That one is one-half mv squared. Hopefully by now you realize it's proportional to mass and inertia. And we discussed the velocity squared part. They did that by experiment and finally put that debate to rest. So we, we run with it. That half came out of experiment, this constant of proportionality. But that's the energy associated with motion. So if something's not moving, what does it not have? Right, kinetic energy. What else does it not have? Yeah, no work would be done on it. That's true. What else does it not have? Momentum, because it's not moving. That's all I'm trying to get at. So, energy associated with motion and energy associated with position. Some other position ones that maybe aren't as obvious. I'll start with a spring. If you have a mass and it's there, it's happy. It's in its equilibrium because the force of the spring is holding it up. It's weight down. But if I displace it, explain to me what just happened, if you can. Louder, though, because I can't hear you. Good. I did work on it. I applied a force over a distance. So, yeah, I did work on it. So that means it must have changed its energy. How? Where did this energy go? I should say. Yeah. It's potential energy. It's stored in the spring because I've changed the position. And so I've stretched the spring. And so molecularly, it's stored in there. It wants to return back like this. And so that's potential energy. It can be stored in something squishy or stretchy. You can compress it too, like this. 
this isn't a compression spring. But they have ones that when you push on them, they push back. This one, when you stretch it, it pulls back. There's different types of springs. And it'll keep oscillating around its equilibrium as it overshoots. You know, here it comes back, and a force is pulling it up, so it accelerates. But then it shoots past. Why? Because it has momentum. Yeah, you can't stop it on a dime, can you? That's impulse. You're trying to change its moment. This force, that restoring force of the spring, is trying to change the momentum. But it can't do it like that. So it overshoots, and then vice versa, back down. So it's changing. Another is a, is a simple rubber band. You store energy in it, right? And then you can shoot it. OK, Victoria, you ready? No? Oh, it'll be going so slow by the time it gets to you. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> shoot it back if you want to have fun. Balls. They squish. We usually don't notice it. But so when it bounces, for that brief part of the collision, where does the energy go? Let's back up. OK, relative to the floor, what's its uh, well, potential energy? Right, what's its kinetic energy? Zero. OK. What's changed? Its potential energy. How much did I give it? How would you find it? Yeah, mgh. It's mass times gravity, it's weight, times the height above the floor. Yeah, so we know exactly how much work I did and how much potential energy it now has. If I let go of it, you know what happens. Where does the energy go? Into kinetic. It transforms in, and it picks up speed. As it falls, the potential energy decreases. But the kinetic energy increases. That's good, because total energy is conserved. If one's going to go down, the other has to go up. How fast is it moving right before it hits the ground? If you knew the amount of energy it started with, could you find that? It's potential energy here. Right before it hits the ground, it's as fast as it's going to be going. Right when it hits the ground, all, all the potential energy goes away. It no longer has gravitational potential. It's all in what form? Kinetic. So all the potential must have got converted. Must have got it. That was good. So what would you do? Well, just, I'll do it over here. The potential at the top is going to get converted to kinetic at the bottom. Do you see that? Exactly, that's where I'm headed. Yeah. So, conservation of energy. Just like conservation of momentum, this one's just more general and works in all kinds of fields of physics. So, again, the potential at the beginning plus the kinetic at the beginning has to equal the potential somewhere else, final, kinetic final. And actually, at any given point, the total energy has to be conserved. And we're looking at potential and kinetic right now. So at the beginning, it doesn't have kinetic, because it wasn't moving in our case. At the bottom, there's no more potential. So whatever value it had at the top must equal the kinetic at the bottom. Notice that it doesn't even care about mass. If you divide both sides by mass, that'll cancel. And so based on just how high up it was in, this, in our gravity, you can determine how fast it'll be moving at the bottom. I think that's pretty cool. And notice, see that V squared again? What if we doubled the height? We dropped it from twice the distance up. Can you guess how fast it'll be going? Relatively speaking, if you're twice as high up, whoosh, how will V change? The, the short answer is it won't double because if this doubles, this squared term is enough for me to know it's, the V's not going to double. And when you get confused, I do this because 
sometimes it's not straightforward. So just, I don't know, make up a number. Sometimes that's easier for folks. So let's say, let's say the beginning was 10 meters up. So if you make it twice as big, it'll now be 20, twice as high. All right, let's say V worked out. Well, we could do that. Let's just do that. If the height is 10, gravity we'll call 10 to make our math easy. Then we have 100 units because I got rid of the mass. So I'll just call it units. Okay, over here, what would V be? we multiply both sides by 2, that will get rid of the half over here. So this will become 200. V squared. Did you follow that step? Just multiplying both sides by 2 to get rid of that half. So V is the square root of 200, whatever the heck that is. <laughs> square root of 100 is 10. Square root, I don't know, somebody want to plug it in real fast? <laughs> It's approximately, I don't know. Somebody will do it. No takers? Fine, we'll go with that. All right. If H is uh, 20 times gravity, we get 200 units. But that equals 1 half V squared. What? No. Oh. So that'll be 400 equals V squared. So V is the square root of 400, which is approximately. What is this one? Nobody has a calculator? 14? Good, thank you. And. Velocity does not double. It actually increases by the square root of 2. Can you see that? Which, that one I know, 1.414 times as much. So don't forget that squared term. Just because you're twice as high doesn't mean it'll be going twice as fast when you hit the bottom. Because that velocity squared is the proportionality term in kinetic energy. Oh, my notes are over here. Oh, yeah. Here's another potential energy form. You, know, you turn to it in your book. You guys ready? Because my daughter liked this. <laughs> oh, it's just one of those things you can spin up the uh, rubber band. So I do work on it. Force over a distance. It's just a circular round and round and round. It stores that energy, potential energy. And the idea is you hide it in your book. And then if you can release that potential energy, it'll turn into kinetic motion. Start flying around. <laughs> but that's fun. I had to buy that. How about a pendulum? If I lift it over here, what's, what form of energy does it have? How about now? Right here. It's all kinetic. How about right here? How about right here? Yeah, it's in, it's in the middle. Um, we're going to do this more next lecture. But if you have your pendulum and it swings back and forth, if it's all up here, it's all potential energy. But again, it's that. It's potential plus kinetic. It's just there's no kinetic over here. Over here, it's potential plus kinetic, but it's not moving. Down here, it's potential plus kinetic, but there's no potential because that's, if that's your zero point. And right here, it's potential plus kinetic. It has a little bit of both. But what do you think the total equals? The same everywhere. This is your roller coaster. This is our makeshift roller coaster for today. Remember, why does everybody like Lagoon? Do you remember 
Remember what I told you? Why people like amusement park rides? Change of momentum. Well, that was a better answer than last time I asked you. <laughs> Most people think, oh, we like going fast. It's not about speed. It's about acceleration, which requires a force, which means your momentum is changing. So, it's, yeah, it's acceleration. You're going around. But now we're going to look at it in terms of energy. You start up here and you pick up speed because you accelerate. And what you're trying to do is convert your energy from what form up here? potential so that you're going fast enough that you can clear this without dying <laughs> and you're all ah! so right down here there's no potential it's all in kinetic and could you figure out how fast you need to be or how fast you would be going down here absolutely mgh up here must equal one half mv squared down here potential up here equals kinetic down here so if you know one you know the other how about right there. When the ball's up here, what form does it have? Potential. Is that it? And kinetic. Yeah. Is it, do you think it has more or less kinetic than down here? Less. Because it slows down as it comes up. But look at it this way. How does its potential energy compare here compared to up here? Less. Yeah, all this potential gets transformed into kinetic, so it's going fast enough. I guess over here. But then it starts coming back up again. So its energy is transforming some of it back into potential, which means the kinetic has to be dropping, which means you're not going as fast. But then it picks up kinetic again, decreases potential, going fast again, and then back to potential. On a roller coaster, all they do is they get you up to the top. That takes work. They're just changing your gravitational potential energy to get you up high enough, and then they just let you go. And then gravity does the rest of the work. That's the total energy you start with. And you go around the loop, and you come up, and you slow down, but then you go over another hill, right? Oh, back <laughs> and around until hopefully you made it. And they design them such that they know how much energy you need to start with so you can finish and, and be safe. Why do you eventually slow down and stop, though? Friction. Friction is always rubbing. And that converts energy into heat. Right, and that escapes our system then. So it's no long, the cart no longer has that energy. I guess I'll uh, start with some clicker questions at the beginning and next time, because I'll finish with this. The ball, back to the ball. It's all potential. It's all kinetic, but for the brief moment it's in contact with the floor, where's the energy? Because when it's in contact with the floor, does it have gravitational potential energy? Is it moving? So it's not gravitational potential and it's not kinetic. But it had to go somewhere, and we see it come back, don't we? All of a sudden, the ball gains kinetic energy again and increases potential energy, gravitational potential. But for that brief moment when it's in contact with the floor, where does that energy go? Into the rubber? Sound? Sound? Is it the air compressing? The, compressing the air in the ball? That takes That's work. All of those are correct. It gets stored in the ball, some of it, like in the air and the rubber. Like a spring, it compresses. So it's elastic potential energy. I don't think I ever told you the term, all these springs and stretchy things. But it's potential energy in the ball. Now, does it come up as high? Let's see, my nose. We, di we didn't get all the energy back. We lost this much. We can know exactly how much we lost, right? It had this much potential energy. Now it only is. Where would that go, though? Heat and sound. So some of it, when it was in contact, went there, too out of our system. It's no longer in the ball as in terms of potential and kinetic. So we don't see it return. But the total is always conserved. If we could grasp that heat and the sound, quantify it, it would exactly equal that dis difference in height. Yeah, different materials, different pressures, you would get a different efficiency. And we're going to cover efficiency next time too with machines and Energy in versus energy out. So, good job.
I'm done.